Good morning. If you have a Bible, turn to James chapter 4. We'll be in the verses that Taryn just read for us. Uh, Happy Mother's Day again to all the moms. As Ina so beautifully said, uh, we as a church uh, know and see God in you and the way that you love and lead. Uh, If you are new to Citizens, my name is Jamin. I'm one of the pastors. If you call Citizens home, welcome. We love you. Uh, There was a book written in 2012. Here's the title of the book, Religion for Atheists, a non-believer's guide to the uses of religion. The author's name was uh, Elaine Botton. He coined the term atheism 2.0. He considers himself in that group. And it's an atheism that is not angry against Christianity necessarily. It's an atheism that is, that is open to uh, reject religious doctrine, but adopt religious practice. So he wrote Religion for Atheists to help atheists know how to do that, how to be religious. Here are a few things he says in the first chapter of his book. The real issue is not whether God exists or not but where to take the argument once one decides that he evidently doesn't. It must be possible to remain a committed atheist and nevertheless find religions sporadically useful, interesting, consoling, and be curious as to the possibilities of importing certain of their ideas and practices into the secular realm. God may be dead, but the urgent issues which impelled us to make him up still stir and demand resolution, which do not go away. So the rest of the book, he he, uh, considers ideas that are known among people of faith, that people of faith would claim that God is the moral undergirding behind these ideas. Things like kindness and community and tenderness. And he basically makes the case that those things don't just have to belong to believers. They are good for everyone. I don't have this quote, but he says in, he says the book, he hopes that the book helps to rescue some of what is beautiful touching and wise from all that no longer seems true. So what's left after that? Well, what you're left with is you're left with a godless religion, a religion for people who don't believe in the existence of God. I read an article this week uh, that talked about atheist churches. It's a small but growing number of people who gather. They call themselves a church. They gather in some in old abandoned church buildings, and they have services. They reject all religious belief, but they adapt religious practices to kind of fit their beliefs. And so if you went there, it would feel like church, but you couldn't find God. He'd be missing. So it's moral principles without belief in divine presence. Laws to follow without a a God to love. It reminds me of what someone has said about our secular world. It's a world that wants the kingdom without the king. There's a lot we could say. Um, Here's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that most of us in the room hear that and we don't like it. That's what I'm assuming. We uh, bristle at the idea of a godless religion. Maybe we'd want to interact with that or argue with that. Church for atheists, right? Maybe we hear him say God is dead and we're offended at those words. If we remove God, here's my response. Thinking about that, reading those quotes, it just makes no sense without God. Um, There are better things to do on a Sunday than observe religion that has no power greater than what we make up. So we're here because we, we believe in God. Most, if not all of us, are here because we believe that God is present among us, active in our world, that he is the God who he has revealed himself to be in his word. So I'm going to give you a chance to amen. We're here because we want more of him in our life, not less of him in our life. Amen. You didn't miss your chance. Praise God. Thank you. Um, this book, Religion for Atheists, came to mind as I was studying these verses Because James is warning us that there is a way to live like that as a Christian. There's a specific area of our life where we are prone to remove God and practice a kind of godless religion, not because we believe he doesn't exist, but because we live as if he's absent. I'm going to read these verses. See if you can hear it. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, 
we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. James speaks to a people who have removed God from their thoughts and words about tomorrow. He's writing to Christians, and he's quoting what he hears the people say when they talk about their plans and when they talk about the future. And in hearing what they are saying, he's saying, I can't find God anywhere in the way you talk about the future. You think and talk about tomorrow as if you don't believe God exists, he's saying. There's a way, even for Christians, to relate to tomorrow that is less like Christian belief and more like religion for atheists. What the Bible is going to teach us is how we relate to tomorrow reveals how we relate to God, what we think about God. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And in the thread underneath the teaching that you find when the Bible talks about tomorrow is when you think about tomorrow, don't stop thinking about God. We're a people, I'm assuming, who don't want to live godless lives. We don't want to live like God is absent. Do you think about tomorrow the way a Christian should think about tomorrow, is the question. When you think about tomorrow, do you think about tomorrow like you're living in God's world and he's present in that world? James frames it this way. James frames it, don't say this, instead say that. So I want to lean into that and just ask the question, what does it sound like to face tomorrow as a Christian? What are the things that a Christian should say and should think when they think about tomorrow? Three things. I don't know. Thank you, God. I trust you, God. That's what it sounds like for a Christian to think and speak about tomorrow. I don't know. Thank you, God. I trust you, God. Look at the verse with me again. We'll start with 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What's going to happen tomorrow? It's Monday, the 12th, May 12th, Monday, May 12th, tomorrow. What will your day look like? If you're asking me, Jamin, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, Mondays start a little slow for me. Um, I will uh, wake up and I sleep in a little later on Mondays usually. Uh, Most Mondays, actually, I'm the last one up in the roller house. Uh, In the roller house, the person who sleeps in the longest is called the sleep champion. Um, It started as a way to motivate our kids to not wake up too early. Uh, and it didn't work. (laughs) They would get so excited about being the sleep champion, they'd wake up earlier to see if they were the sleep champion. My goal tomorrow on Monday is to be the sleep champion in the roller house. And then I'll make coffee. I'll sit in the chair by the window and drink coffee. Ayla will come, most likely, crawl into my lap. We'll spend time together. The dog will also come and beg for love. And uh, mid-morning, I'll come to the church and I'll spend a few hours uh, studying. Uh, I have a meeting uh, with Taryn at one. I have a meeting with Joe at two. Uh, Tomorrow evening, we have dinner with friends. Tomorrow night, the Dallas Mavericks play, and I will watch that game. We'll watch it as a family, and I will text about that game with a few other dads who love the Mavs, and we'll just pray that God's team wins the game. Uh, That's tomorrow. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure all that's going to happen. You know what an honest answer is? Jamin, what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe even a, a more honest answer. I don't know. Um, I have a plan, but I don't have control over tomorrow. How many of you have lived through days that went different than you planned? For better or for worse, went different than planned. Is anyone in the room living a life that just hasn't gone according to plan? James states a truth we should all agree with just experientially. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. We don't. We have limited, not not just tomorrow, the next decade of life, anything about the future. We have limited knowledge as humans, and few things expose that limited knowledge like the future, an unpredictable future. Why is that so important? What's the big deal about making a plan? James uh, quotes people. They sound like entrepreneurs. They sound like self-starters. We're going to go into this city. We're going to spend this much amount of time. We're going to make this much money. They're they're entrepreneurs. Isn't that a good thing? Like they're not the sluggard of Proverbs who just turns over and over in their bed and doesn't work, right? 
Isn't it good? Yes, it is good. God is not against plans. God is against pride. And you can find verses that talk about the wisdom of planning and discernment and all of that. So if you're in here and, and you're the kind of person that just loves to plan, uh, take a deep breath. There's a part of that that's okay. But the problem with who James is talking about here, they weren't planning for tomorrow like they are human. They were planning for tomorrow like they were God. Like they know all there is to know. And the more we believe about tomorrow that we know all there is to know, the less we depend on God. There's two ways to try and be like God. Uh, one is foolish and one is good. And if we confuse the two, we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. The good way to try and be like God is when we are like him in his character. Proverbs 145, 8 says this, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Can we be like God in this way? Yes. J James, in chapter 1, be slow to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. We can be like God, not perfectly, but faithfully. If this is who you are to your friends and to your kids and to your spouse, if you are gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love and slow to anger, that honors God, that blesses them. We should strive to be like God in that way. We can become like God. God says, be holy as I'm holy. Only through Jesus, only because he died on the cross, rose again, gives us his presence, his grace to sanctify us and change us. We can't perfectly be like God, but we can faithfully be like God. It's Mother's Day, you know that? Uh, I've said this about my mom often. My mom is the godliest woman I know. She's the godliest woman I know. And it's, it's a, like most people who are godly in the way she's godly, it's a hard fought godliness. It's a godliness that has come through suffering and trial and holding on to Jesus when everything else falls apart. When my kids spend time with her, they come back with two things. They come back with embarrassing stories about me when I was a kid, and they come back with Bible verses that their grandma taught them. She's godly. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I don't, I don't think she watches, but maybe. <laughs> we can be like God in that way. That's what we mean when we call someone godly. Psalm 90, 2 and 4. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. For in your sight, a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by, like a few hours of the night. From eternity to eternity. Some translations say it from everlasting to everlasting. He sees all. God's not bound by time. Isaiah 46.10, this is God speaking. I declare the end from the beginning. And from long ago, what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place and I will do all my will. God knows what is not yet done. Theologians have a word for this. They call this God's omniscience. It's his perfect knowledge of all things, past, present, and future. Can we be like God in this way? No. James says, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. God sees beginning to the end. All of his plans are going to come to pass. We don't even know about tomorrow. Everlasting to everlasting God, he does. He knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. He's the one who was and is and will always be, and we're not him. And when we think about our future and plan our future as if we know the way God knows, James calls it arrogant. It's arrogant. God never says, be all-knowing as I am all-knowing. Let's draw it out with a question. An angel comes to you, like a, like a real one. An angel comes to you and says, hey, I just need you, God sent me, and um, you need to know that tomorrow is going to be a really important day in your life. And you think, well, what does that mean? Is that, is that good or is that bad? What will happen? And they say, I'm going to give you a choice. And the angel is holding out two cups. They're big golden goblets. That's the kind of cups that angels have, I think. And he, they say this, here's this cup. If you drink this cup, you will have all of God's infinite knowledge about tomorrow. You will know exactly what's coming. You'll know how to prepare and how to plan for whatever tomorrow brings. This cup, if you drink this cup, you will have God's holy character. You still won't know what's coming tomorrow, but you will have the character required to face whatever it brings. What do you do? Drink this cup and you'll have all God's infinite knowledge. You can plan, prepare. Drink this cup, you'll have God's holy character. You won't know, but you'll have the character required. 
Which one do you choose? Which one does your heart want? (laughs) The control that comes from knowing what to expect or the character able to face whatever comes? Do you want God's knowledge or God's character? Here's the thing. Only one of those is actually offered to us. Only one. We cannot become like God in his omniscience. We can become like him in his holiness, in his character. And often what happens, friends, is I'm convicted over this. Often we pursue the one we can't have and neglect the one we can. It's what James means when he says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it's sin. There are a whole host of things we already know about what God wants for us today. Faithfulness he's called us into, obedience he's called us into. And when we neglect that and tomorrow does come, we are not prepared for what it brings because we didn't pursue the character required to face a life that is out of our control. It reminds me of the decision Adam and Eve made in the garden. They chose to try and be like God in ways that were not possible at the expense of being like God in ways that were already true. What does a Christian say about about tomorrow? I don't know. I don't know. I have a plan, but I'm not God. And I'm not going to try to be like him in ways that I can't. And let that, goodness, let that I don't know, that honest, embracing limits, human I don't know, let us lead that to God in the present. I don't know about tomorrow, but I do know God can change me today. He offers grace today that I need to slowly, imperfectly become more and more like Jesus. I don't know. Thank you, God. James says this, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. James asks a question, and then he offers an image as the answer. What is your life? It's a mist. It's the word for steam, smoke. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes. The word used there is hevel. It's the same picture. It's like fog in the morning, and it's gone by lunch. Um, it's like steam from a kettle. It, it, it's there for just a moment. It's like smoke from a candle. You blow out the candle, the smoke lingers, but it never lingers very long. And James says it appears for a little time and then vanishes, and life is just like that. That's life. Our youngest had her pre-K end of year celebration at school. They had a festival. She dressed up like a fish. They sang songs and recited poems. At the end of the festival, their teacher spoke this beautiful blessing over their little lives. And then she turned to the parents and the grandparents and the friends, and she said, thank you for coming to celebrate the class of 2037. And everyone did that. Everyone (laughs) chuckled. It was the first time we'd all in that setting heard the year that they would graduate. And it's funny because it sounds so far away. 2037 sounds like a pretend year. It just doesn't feel real. Last week was Senior Sunday at Citizens. Celebrated 11 seniors, the class of 2024. You know what I heard from parents? Went by so fast. There was a moment when 2024 sounded like a long time away, and then it comes, and everyone who's living in it says it flew by. It flew by. So the time from now till 2037, you know what that's going to feel like? A vapor. It's going to feel like a mist. It's going to feel like kettle steam that's there, and then it's gone. And James says all of life is like that, all of life. It appears for a little time, and then it's gone. Wisdom reminds us of that. Life is short. Wisdom's voice, if we have ears to hear, wisdom's voice in several different places in the Bible are going to direct our attention to this reality. Life is short. There's wisdom in remembering the brevity of life. Psalm 90, 12 says it like this. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now let's pause for a second. Are you busy? Is life busy? Hey, how are you? How have things been? Oh man, I just have nothing at all to do. The days are just crawling by. In fact, would you add some more tasks to my day? Because I just, I'm pretty bored. No one says that. No one says that. Hey, how are you? Swamped. Busiest I've ever been. Can't, can't get ahead. Feel like I'm behind in every way. 
I heard someone say, you know you're an adult when nothing excites you as much as canceled plans. <laughs> Days feel so full. There's more to do than we have time to do. And so when that meeting is canceled, when that practice that the kid didn't even want to go to is canceled, right? A friend of mine joked that he was going to schedule a weekly meeting with me that he always cancels the day of just to show me how much he loves me. <laughs> and I, I felt so seen in that moment. We're busy people living short lives. And, and somewhere in the mix of all that, we're also a very distracted people, which is ironic. Everyone feels like there are not enough hours in the day, and yet the amount of time people spend on their phones, streaming, social media, it increases year over year. It's this weird paradox of feeling like we don't have enough time while squandering a lot of time all at the same time. We are a people who rush through our work and then waste our rest. Things we have to do, we, we, we feel rushed to get it done. And then the time we have to rest, we fill it with things that are less like rest and more like escape. Our work is rushed, our rest is wasted. I bring all that up to say, you know what it could feel like when we hear life is short? Man, life is candle smoke. It could feel like the wise response is to speed up in a short life. Do more, move quick, fill the days with as much as we can because like smoke over a candle, it lingers and then it's gone. So I gotta make the most of it while it's here, but it's not. The wise response is not to speed up. You know what the wise response is? Give thanks. Give thanks. Gratitude is the wise way to live in a short life. You know what gratitude does? It slows you down. We learn this in Ecclesiastes. If you remember, the book accuses life of being hevel, smoke. It accuses life of being that over 30 times in 12 chapters. And the foolish thing to try to do is to exert our control and treat life like a problem to solve. And the foolish thing to do is to compare our life to everyone else and treat life like a competition to win. And the foolish thing to do is to get bitter when things don't go our way and treat life like a right I've earned. And wisdom says life is too short to live like that. Ecclesiastes 3 says, I perceive there's nothing better for them. In light of all of those things, how short life is, how confusing life is, there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Life is a gift. It's a gift. And we live well in a short life by opening our hands and receiving the life we've been given as a gift from God. James says, it's a short little phrase. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. Not if the Lord wills, and then we rush to go make our plans. If the Lord wills, we'll wake up. If the Lord wills. It's all, it's all great. I was, I was reminded of this quote from Frederick Beekner. We've talked about it before. But he says this, oh, it slows me down. Listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery it is in the boredom and pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments and life itself is grace. Life is short, but there's something different when we say life is short, it's going too fast, I need to speed up versus life is short and it's all grace. And I need to give thanks. When the Christian thinks about tomorrow, the Christian give thanks for today. Because tomorrow is not promised, and today is a gift. Today is a gift. How different would life be if every time you felt busy, you stopped and gave thanks? How different would it be if every time you thought of all you needed to do tomorrow, you stopped and said, God, I lived today because you willed it. Thank you, God. Life is a gift and you are the giver. Thank you, God. I don't know. Thank you, God. I trust you, God. Instead, you ought to say, verse 15, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. You ever heard someone say that? Lord willing? What does that mean? We talk about the will of God a lot, and much of it, I'll just speak for me. Often when I talk about God's will, 
I'm almost always talking about trying to figure out what to do. That's what we mean. Is it God's will, you know, that I change jobs? Is it God's will that we make this decision? Maybe for some, it's, is it God's will that I date this person? Is it God's will that we fill in the blank? See something with me? Zach Eswine pointed this out to me. Uh, he's a friend. Paul in Acts chapter 20. There's something that happens here that I just don't know that I had category for, for much of my Christian life. He's leaving Ephesus. He calls his friends together. Everyone's sad. He loves these people. They don't want to see him leave. There's a pretty good chance that they'll never see him again. And listen to what he says in Acts 20, verse 22. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I'll encounter, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. And now I'm on my way to Jerusalem. That's what he's going to do. That's his plan compelled by the Spirit. It's God's will that he goes. The Spirit compelled him. He's doing what God has willed for him to do, not knowing what I will encounter there. What? If he's compelled by the Spirit, shouldn't he have all the answers? Shouldn't he have all the details of what he's going to encounter there, what God has waiting for him? It's the will of God. He knows the will of God. It seems possible to know the will of God and still not know what's going to happen. Here's why this is important, two sides of this. Sometimes people can claim God's will and be just as arrogant as what James is warning about. Sometimes people can claim God's will so that no one can challenge their decision. God told me to, and then they describe something with an amount of certainty that the Apostle Paul didn't even get. No one gets to speak in. No one gets to challenge and say, hey, are you sure this is right? Was this really God? It's a way to sound spiritual about our decision-making and avoid responsibility at the same time. It's also important. There's another side of it. It's also important because when we think knowing God's will means having every answer, when we think knowing God's will means I get super specific details about what I'm supposed to do, it can paralyze us in indecision because we're waiting for an amount of clarity that we've associated with God's will that might not actually be God's will. Like, I can't do anything unless God gives me all the details. A few weeks ago, I had lunch with a new friend. We had just met. We're sharing stories. He's a worship leader. And he asked me this question. He said, when did you know God wanted you to be a pastor? And I said, I'm not completely sure he does. I'm not. God never, God never told me. And I think this is what God wants me to do. But I never got like a golden letter from heaven or anything like that. And I used to get real tripped up about this, friends, because I would hear other people say, other people who do what I do say things like, God told me to marry this person and plant this church in this city, and in the first five years, do these three things, and God gave me his plan for my life. And I'm over here like, what's wrong with me? I haven't got, why doesn't God talk to me like that? Does God speak with specificity to some people in that kind of way? Yes, he does. God's never spoken to me in that kind of way. You know what God told me? God told me he loves me so much that he sent his precious son to die in my place and rise in victory over sin and death that I might know him and follow him. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He told me that in his word. He told me I have a future inheritance kept in heaven with our risen king. He told me that. He told me he sent his very spirit as helper and comforter so that he is always with me and I'm never alone. He told me his kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven. And one day when Jesus returns, his glorious kingdom will be all that there is. He told me all of that in his word. You know what that is? That's his will for my life. How do I know I'm supposed to be a pastor here? I really love the church. I love the church. I love talking about the Bible. I find it, it is, it is the privilege of my life to be used by God as a shepherd among his people. So pastor seems like a good fit. I think it's God's will. I like y'all a whole lot. I know that. I want to offer something that I'm still teasing out. And maybe I didn't land on the best way to say it. But I think if the Lord wills, knowing the will of God, it's less figuring out what am I supposed to do, and it's more turning from what I don't know about tomorrow to what I do know about my God. That's God's will. Knowing God's will is less certainty about the future and more trust in God's heart. 
And here's where this is really helpful. This is exactly what Jesus offers as the cure for anxiety. When James talks about tomorrow, he talks about arrogance, when we act like we know what we don't know. When Jesus talks about tomorrow, he talks about anxiety, when we are afraid of what we don't know. Anxiety, at least, I don't know, it's complicated, it's a loaded word, at least the way Jesus talks about it, anxiety is the fear response to what we don't know about tomorrow. And he looks out at disciples who are asking, will I have anything to eat tomorrow? Will I have clothes to wear tomorrow? So they're not boasting about tomorrow. They're, they're afraid of tomorrow. Jesus speaks to that, and he offers what our hearts need. Listen for how Jesus talks about the will of God in this passage. Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? In which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear for the Gentiles, those who don't believe in God, seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He invites this turn. I'm turning from what I don't know about tomorrow to what I do know about God. Will I eat tomorrow? That's what I don't know. My heavenly Father feeds the birds, and he cares about me more than them. That's what I do know. Will I have something to wear tomorrow? That's what I don't know. My heavenly father dresses the lilies and he loves me more than he loves them. That's what I do know. Will I have a job tomorrow? That's what I don't know. The Lord promised to supply my every need. That's what I do know. Will everything be okay tomorrow? I don't know. But God promised to be with me always, even to the end of the age. That's what I do know. Will I live tomorrow? I don't know. All who belong to Jesus will reign with him forever when he returns. That's what I do know. My God cares for me. Your God cares for you. It is the will of God. You know what God's will is? It is the will of God to be a good father to you and keep every single one of his promises to you. If the Lord wills is a way of saying, I trust the father's heart. And like Paul I can say the Spirit leads me, and I don't know what will happen, but I do know who to trust. Brothers and sisters, we don't want to be a, be a people who claim that God is real, but face the future like he doesn't exist. When we think about tomorrow, when we speak about tomorrow, the Christian says, I don't know, I'm not God, so I will pursue his holiness, not claim his knowledge. The Christian says, this life is short. Thank you, God, for today. This life is a gift. The Christian says, Lord, your will is to do good to those who love you. Whatever you will, I trust. I trust you with tomorrow, God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are, for what you've done. Oh, God, it would be so scary to not know about tomorrow and also to not know about your character. That would be the worst. To not know about tomorrow and then also not know about who God is and what God is like and what it means. So we thank you. You have not revealed everything and there are so many things that so many of us would just love to know, but you have revealed enough for us to trust you. So friends, as, as you're praying with me, would you pray in a couple different directions? Would you pray that God would confront our arrogance? Not speaking for you, you know you, if it applies. Would you say, God, forgive me for my arrogance, confront my arrogance. The arrogance that tries to exert control I don't have to the neglect of the character that I so desperately need. God, forgive us. 
for trying to be you in ways that are forbidden and neglecting to be you in the ways that you have so lovingly invited. The other side, friends, would you pray? And if this applies, would you ask God to comfort you in your anxiety and worry? Whatever it is going on in your life, the things that are unknown about tomorrow that feel most threatening to you, would you ask God to comfort you? Tell him in your prayers, your will is to be a good father to me. God, we live in this interesting time with you where we are the people who don't know what will happen tomorrow. And at the same time, we know where we will spend eternity. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, but we do know that there's a day coming where our king returns. Everything sad is untrue, and we rule and reign and worship and commune face to face with our risen Lord forever and ever. Amen. And so those two realities, God, would you use what we don't know about tomorrow to humble us? And would you use what we do know about eternity to build us up? Comfort us, hold us. We love you and we need you. Jeremy, pray. Amen.